I'll ask you to open up your Bible to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11, prophecy on steroids. <laughs> well, today we are going to cover one of the most complicated and detailed prophecies in the whole Bible. Dr. Mark Hitchcock, who's a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, claimed that there is at least 135 specifically fulfilled prophecies in this chapter alone. And so that's why I'm calling this prophecy on steroids. Now, remember our setting. Daniel, the prophet, he's, he's writing this chapter. This is in 536 B.C., but he's writing about things that are still future for him. Some are in the near future for Daniel, and some are in the distant future. So some are, are past for us, the things that he prophesies, but some are future for us as well as for Daniel. So he sees his near future and far future. This vision that Daniel receives from God contains meticulously accurate predictions which history has shown to come true, as well as having prophecies concerning the very end of time. This chapter has come under great attack by critics because they deny even the possibility of supernatural inspiration. So, of course, this is written after the fact because how could it have all these things come true? that were prophesied. Well, we know that Daniel is not fraudulent for a number of reasons. Number one, the Jews would never have accepted a fraudulent book in their canon. But I think a, a more solid critique of the critics is Jesus Christ himself. I, I find this is a, a great way, you know, to combat those liberal critics of the Bible. Just use the words of Christ. What did Christ say? Listen to this. This is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, our great God and Savior. He's quoting from Daniel, and he refers to him as the prophet, as a prophet. Matthew 24, 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. So in other words, God incarnate, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, gives this book his stamp of approval. He says, it's true. If it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Is that good enough for you? Amen. So there you go. So what we're reading is this amazing prophecy. All these things were detailed, laid out in detail before they even happened. And I think that's amazing. That should bolster our faith. Here's what theologian John Walverd said about this. He said, the issue is a clear-cut question as to whether God is omniscient about the future. If he is, Revelation may be just as detailed as God elects to make it. And detailed prophecy is no more difficult or incredible than broad predictions. I just find it amazing how people can believe in an all-knowing God and then think it's too hard for him to predict the future and tell us about it. It's like, what? <laughs> Anyways, to get the scope of this vision, uh, here's a bird's eye view, more or less. Verse 1 and 2 of the chapter have to do with Persia. Verse 3 through 20 have to do with Greece. Verse 21 through 35 are this intertestamental period between the Old and New Testament. We don't have any inspired scripture regarding that other than this prophecy here. But this is the period of the Maccabees in which Syria and Egypt are, are warring against each other. And then 36 through 45 is this incredible section which is in the distant future for Daniel and future for us as well regarding the Antichrist. And so we're going to get a couple more bits of information about this future world ruler that we know as the Antichrist here in this chapter. So that's, that's the scope as far as nations go. As far as rulers go, there's actually five prominent rulers mentioned in this chapter, and they all begin with A. Verse 2 mentions Ahasuerus, a.k.a. Xerxes. Verse 3 through 4 are about Alexander the Great. Verse 10 through 20 about Antiochus III, also known as the Great, Antiochus the Great. Verse 21 through 35 are Antiochus IV Epiphanes. We've talked about him before. Remember that slime ball Syrian king who is a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. And then verse 36 through 45 are, are the future Antichrist in view there. So with all that said, I know this might be a difficult study today. Believe me, I'm doing my best to break this down in an understandable way. But if you get nothing else from today, I thought I'd give you the points right up front. How's that sound? So let's, let's actually say these together so we can affirm these. Ready? God is faithful. God is in charge and can be trusted. God will deal with evil. Let's say it again. 
God is faithful, God is in charge and can be trusted, God will deal with evil. That's the bottom line. Should we close in prayer? Let's, let's go through the text. Uh, we're going to talk about these again, but I wanted to give you these up front. These, these are truths that we can take home, even if you get lost in a little bit of the history today. But this first section that we read is the near future for Daniel. These are things that are past for us, but that were future for Daniel. As we pick up the chapter, remember that this is an angel speaking to Daniel. Chapter 10, we saw that whole thing about the angelic warfare, and it's likely Gabriel that is speaking to Daniel here after a delay of three weeks. And so he's, he's giving him this vision. Now that here's the vision in chapter 11, and chapter 12 is kind of like a postscript to the whole vision. One fascinating thing about this is this vision that we're reading today was so important that Satan wanted to thwart it from even getting to us. He didn't want this to be recorded and reported. And so I find that fascinating. Satan didn't want us to read this today. Let's see what it is. The angel broke through and shared this message with Daniel. And so let's read it. First, let me pause and pray. Heavenly Father, we give this morning to you. Lord, enlighten our minds this morning. We need you, God. There's important truth here for us. Not only for knowledge, Lord, but for wisdom and living. To know what's ahead, what to expect. And ultimately to know that you're in control of history, you're in control of the future. Father, thank you for this morning. We pray that we would use it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's look at verse 1 and 2 of Daniel chapter 11. It says this, In the first year of Darius the Mede, I arose to be of assistance and a protection for him. Let me pause right there real fast. This I, remember this is the, the angel speaking. So I find this fascinating. Here we have this angel saying that he arose to be of assistance and a protection for this Persian king. Well, remember, this is the guy who sent the Jews back from exile, back to start rebuilding Jerusalem, to go back to their homeland. And so I think this angel here has a special ministry of protecting Darius, the Medes, so that he can do his ministry for the Jews. Now, continuing on, verse 2. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings are going to arise in Persia. Then a fourth will gain far more riches than all of them. As soon as he becomes strong through his riches, he will stir up the entire empire against the realm of Greece. Six years after the angel spoke these words to Daniel, these prophecies start to become true. After Darius the Mede, also known as Cyrus, there were three more kings of Persia. Cambyses, here's, here's a good name, Pseudo Smyrtus. Uh, fake Smyrtus, I guess. <laughs> he, he, he wasn't a real Smyrtus. He was a fake Smyrtus. But anyways, pseudo Smyrtus, and then another Darius the Great. Again, I don't know if these guys gave themselves these names. No, Alexander the Great, Antiochus the Great, Darius the Great. And then we have this fourth Persian king, Xerxes, who was the king reigning during Esther's day. And we're going to learn a lot about him fairly soon here as we get into an Esther study after this. But this Xerxes, this fourth king, Persian king, he hated Greece with a passion. I mean, he, he despised the Greeks. And so he's constantly trying to attack, and he was failing. Eventually, Greece actually conquered Persia under Alexander the Great. Now, you might be wondering, okay, there's a lot about Persia and Greece in there. Why isn't America in there, or, or China, or India? You know, why are these... Why are these specific nations mentioned and, you know, other ones aren't? Well, Persia and Greece were two empires that specifically tried to wipe out the people of God. And so they're significant in their relationship to the Jews in particular. And so I, I believe that's why they're, they're mentioned here as opposed to other nations. Now let's look at verse 3 and 4. And a mighty king, this is Alexander the Great, and a mighty king will arise and he will rule with a great authority and do as he pleases. But as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom will be broken up and parceled out toward the four points of the compass. Though not to his own descendants, nor according to his authority, which he wielded, because his sovereignty will be removed and given to others beside him. Now, we've already seen this in Daniel described in a different way. But it, the story is that the mighty king Alexander the Great, he died in his young 30s. I, I think it was a month before his 33rd birthday. He died at the height of his career at a drunken party in Babylon. 
And his only heirs to the throne were either unfit to rule, they were cuckoo, or they were quickly murdered. And so here's Alexander the Great. He pretty much conquers the known world for Greece. He dies young. And then what's going to happen with all this land that he conquered? Well, his four generals divided it up amongst themselves. There was Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, Seleucus. Once again, good baby names for some of the boys in the church. Just a couple ideas there for you. There was a fifth general, one-eyed Antigonus, who was killed, so he's not in the list here. But there's four generals. Essentially, you know, it talks about the four points of the compass. Alexander the Great's Greek Empire was split amongst the generals. Now, much of what comes next is focused in on two of these four generals, whose dominions directly affect the promised land of Israel. So there's Ptolemy, who's in Egypt, and in this chapter, everything having to do with Egypt is called the king of the south. And then there's Seleucus, who is the Syrian dynasty to the north of Israel. So you have Egypt in the south, Syria in the north. And who's in the middle between them? Israel is. Here's a little map. Uh, you got Ptolemy down south. You got Seleucus up north. And they're going to be essentially their empires, their descendants, are just fighting with each other for hundreds of years, trampling over Israel that lies in between the two. So they just trample over the Holy Land. Now a large portion of this chapter, which we'll go through relatively quickly, is essentially breaking down this rocky relationship between the kings of the north and the kings of the south, just hashing it out. And uh, it, it reads kind of like a telenovela, okay? There's a, there's a lot of drama going on here, you know. But uh, let's look at verse 5. Then the king of the south will grow strong along with one of his princes who will gain ascendancy over him and rule. His domain will be a great realm indeed. And after some years, they will form an alliance. And the daughter of the king of the south will come to the king of the north to reach an agreement. But she will not keep her position of power, nor will he remain with this power, but she will be given up along with those who brought her in and the one who fathered her, as well as he who supported her in those times. But one of the descendants of her line will arise in his place and he will come against their army and enter the fortress of the king of the north, and he will deal with them and prevail. And he will also take into captivity to Egypt their gods with their cast metal images and their precious vessels of silver and gold. And he on his part will refrain from attacking the king of the north for some years. Then the latter will enter the realm of the king of the south, but will return to his own land. How quickly did it take for that fog to set in your mind when we read that? Be honest. Like 2.3 seconds? Maybe. I mean, it's, it's challenging stuff, but it is very fascinating when you, when you actually start to dig behind the history here. That Remember, this is prophecy laid out in advance, but if you look at the history, how did this play out? Well, this is talking about the saga of Ptolemy I of Egypt, who had a son, Ptolemy II. They founded a, a dynasty down there in Egypt. Now, they wanted to seal an alliance with Syria in the north, and so normally the way you do that is you have some intermarriage. And so Ptolemy II gave his daughter, whose name was Berenice, in marriage to a Syrian king named Antiochus II. But in order for him to make that happen, he actually divorced the wife that he already had in order to marry this Egyptian girl. And, uh, you know, they say, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. That wife who was put away, she proceeds to murder that hussy, Berenice from the south, and then... Also her son, her baby son, and then she poisoned her ex-husband too. And then what does she do with all that power vacuum? She puts her own son on the throne, Seleucus II. So bloody history going on here. And then obviously Egypt is not going to be fine with all of their dignitaries being killed up there. And so the next king, Ptolemy III, avenges the murder of who was his sister Berenice. He attacks, defeats Syria, and then murders the murderer Laodice. So just a small sample of the drama. What comes next, there's more alliances, more marriages, more wars, a victory for the north, a comeback from the south. The north occupies the promised land. They make yet another alliance, and then yet more defeats for the kings of the south, more temper tantrums. It's really complicated. We are going to read it all, but I'm only going to stop and point out some of the more salient, interesting parts of the history as we go on. You guys good with that? Okay. Verse 10. 
And his sons will mobilize and assemble a multitude of great forces. And one of them will keep on coming and overflow and pass through so that he may again wage war up to his fortress. And the king of the south will be enraged and go out and fight with the king of the north. Then the latter will raise a great multitude, but that multitude will be handed over to the former. When the multitude is carried away, his heart will be haughty, and he will cause tens of thousands to fall, yet he will not prevail. For the king of the north will again raise a greater multitude than the former, and after an interval of some years, he will press on with a great army and much equipment. Now in those times, many will rise up against the king of the south. The violent ones among your people will also raise themselves up to fulfill the vision, but they will fall down. Then the king of the north will come up, pile up an assault ramp, and capture a well-fortified city, and the forces of the south will not stand their ground, not even their choicest troops, for there will be no strength to make a stand. But he who comes against him will do as he pleases, and no one will be able to withstand him. He will also stay for a time in the beautiful land with destruction in his hand. Now let's stop right there. I just love how God refers to Israel here. Notice that it says the beautiful land. That's the way that God sees the promised land of Israel. Israel was always cherished and loved by God. He calls them the apple of his eye. In spite of all their rebellion, this is the way that God views the nation of Israel and the promised land, which he vouchsafed for Abraham and his descendants. He calls it the beautiful land. But this beautiful land is getting trampled by these kings of the north and south, and it continues on. Verse 17. And he will set his mind on coming with the power of his entire kingdom, bringing with him a proposal of peace, which he will put into effect. He will also give him the daughter of women to ruin it. But she will not take a stand for him or be on his side. Then he will turn his face to the coastlands and capture many. But a commander will put a stop to his taunting against him. Moreover, he will repay him for his taunting. So he will turn his face toward the fortresses of his own land, but he will stumble and fall and not be found. How many of you guys have ever heard of Cleopatra before? Cleopatra? There's actually a few different Cleopatras, but as I'm doing the research here, I, I like to visualize the people. Sometimes there's these marble busts of, of these different characters. Look at what Cleopatra looks like. She looks like me. <laughs> I'm looking at this picture, I'm like, oh my goodness, man. I had no idea Cleopatra looked like me. <laughs> anyway, I just thought that was crazy. But uh, here's the story in a nutshell. Just like we saw the Egyptian king do before with uh, trying to make an alliance through uh, sending a daughter up north, now they're doing it in reverse. The Syrian king, Antiochus III, tries to make an alliance with Egypt by offering his daughter in marriage, this Cleopatra here. She was 11 years old at the time. He sends her down to marry Ptolemy V of Egypt, and this is his plan. I'm going to destroy Egypt from within. I'm going to send my daughter down there to marry this Egyptian king, but she's going to be my spy. It didn't work out as he planned because she actually fell in love with her husband. I mean, that's kind of amazing how that worked in this arranged marriage, but she had more allegiance to the Egyptian dynasty than the Syrian, and so it didn't work out. Antiochus III then got so mad that he came down to attack Egypt, but he was unsuccessful. And then what did he do? He returned back home and took out his rage on his own people. That's what it's describing in these verses. He attacked the temple of Jupiter, and his citizens were furious at their leader for doing this. And so they rose up and killed him, and his body was never found. So there's some pretty interesting stuff going on in history here. Now we're going to hit a longer section and remember Antiochus IV Epiphanes, that madman, the foreshadowing figure of the Antichrist. Now we start to talk about him. I'm going to do verse 20 through 35, so buckle up. Then in his place, one will arise who will allow an oppressor to pass through the jewel of his kingdom. Yet within a few days, he will be broken, though not in anger nor in battle. And in his place, a despicable person will arise on whom the majesty of kingship has not been conferred. But he will come in a time of tranquility and seize the kingdom by intrigue. And the overflowing forces will be flooded away from him and smashed, and also the prince of the covenant. After an alliance is made with him, he will practice deception, and he will go up and gain power with a small force of people. In a time of tranquility, he will enter the richest parts of the realm, and he will accomplish what his fathers did not, nor his ancestors, 
He will distribute plunder, spoils, and possessions among them, and he will devise his schemes against strongholds, but only for a time. And he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south with a large army. So the king of the south will mobilize an extremely large and mighty army for war, but he will not stand because schemes will be devised against him. Those who eat his choice food will destroy him, and his army will overflow, but many will fall down slain. As for both kings, their hearts will be intent on evil, and they will speak lies to each other at the same table, but it will not succeed because the end is still to come at the appointed time. Then he will return to his land with much plunder, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant, and he will take action and then return to his own land. At the appointed time, he will return and come into the south, but this last time it will not turn out the way it did before, for ships of Kittim, that's the island of Cyprus, will come against him. Therefore, he will withdraw in fear and will return and curse the holy covenant and take action. So he will come back and pay attention to those who abandon the holy covenant. This is where it's turning towards the, the Jewish people. Forces from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress, and do away with the regular sacrifice, and they will set up the abomination of desolation. Everybody say that, abomination of desolation. That's an important phrase. We talked about this before, uh, but this is something that Jesus also talked about in reference to the future, a future thing that's going to happen in the sanctuary. Verse 32, and by smooth words, he will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant. But the people who know their God will be strong and take action. And those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. Yet they will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. Now when they fall, they will be granted a little help, and many will join with them in hypocrisy. And some of those who have insight will fall to refine, purge, and cleanse them until the end time, because it is still to come at the appointed time. Okay, you can pat yourself on the back for making it through that much text there. Now, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, we've already met this despicable person in our study. He's the slime ball. He's the Antichrist of the Old Testament, you could say. He's the little horn of chapter 8. He's the madman. He's the one who called himself Epiphanes. In other words, God manifest. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm God. <laughs> that was his mindset. Horrible person. Now, what a lot of what we read is describing his rise and kind of his finagling his way into power through bribes and gifts. He actually had no legitimate claim to the Syrian throne, uh, but he weaseled his way in there. And as Syrian king of the north, he stirred up battle once more with the Egyptian dynasty down south. But he couldn't win. The Egyptians partnered up with the Roman navy, and they spanked the Syrians. They sent them back home. And actually, there's this fascinating story about how this uh, Roman general drew a line in the sand around Antiochus, where they're, they're coming up for a little parlay together. And this Roman general drew a circle around him. And he said, by the time you step out of that circle, you need to tell me if you're going to retreat or advance. If you decide to advance, we're going to crush you. But if you decide to retreat, that's good for you. You, you can get out of here without us attacking your back. And so that's actually the origin of our, our phrase, draw a line in the sand. I just thought that was kind of interesting. So here's Antiochus IV. He actually does retreat. He goes back up north to Syria. He leaves with his tail between his legs, submission to the Romans, but he's ticked. And these guys got to take it out on somebody, right? Now as he goes up north, where does he pass through? Israel. He's going to take it all out on the Jews. He comes back north. He acts out his anger on the Jews in Jerusalem. He causes incredible damage there. He persecutes the people heavily. Antiochus IV is said to have killed 80,000 Jews, sold another 40,000 as slaves, and then taken 40,000 additional as prisoners. And then we already talked about this. He, de he defiled the holy temple. He put an image of Zeus up in the temple. He commanded that the daily Jewish sacrifices be stopped. And then he sacrifices a pig, this unclean animal, on the holy altar inside of the temple. So this despicable leader is here, this foreshadowing of the Antichrist. But I want to show you my favorite part of this whole chapter. It's right in verse 32. It's this tiny glimmer of light, this little glimmer of hope that is found at the end of verse 32. Look at it. It says, But the people who know their God 
will be strong and take action. But the people who know their God will be strong and take action. I think that's an encouraging verse set inside this prophecy about horrible persecution. The direct referent here is about the, the Maccabees. They were like Jewish guerrilla warfare people who, they didn't like what Antiochus did, obviously, profaning their temple. And so they rose up against him. And there, there's this man, Mattathias, uh, whose last name was uh, Maccabeus, which means the hammer. And he had five sons. His third son, Judah, kind of rose to the top as the, the main guerrilla warrior. And they took back the temple. They reclaimed it. They cast Antiochus IV out. And in 164 BC, they rededicated the temple. That's the uh, origin of the Hanukkah holiday. Anyways, a lot of history here. What does all this teach us about God? Well, God is faithful. Remember our first point. God is faithful. He doesn't ever forget his people. These people knew their God. They were strong and they took action and they reclaimed the temple for themselves. No matter how bad it gets, us today who know our God, we can be strong. We can trust our God. We can be strong in him. We can serve him effectively even in the midst of great trials. And as we approach the end of days, each day we're a day closer than we were yesterday, greater persecution will likely come. 2 Timothy 3.12 says this, Indeed, all who want to live in a godly way in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now here in the United States, we're almost surprised by persecution. Like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you would make fun of me for being a Christian. And it's like, throughout all of history, Christians have had it so much worse physical, violent persecution, for us, it, it perhaps still feels like it's a long way off. And praise God for that blessing of peace that we've enjoyed. Uh, but we still do undergo a measure of persecution for our faith here. We're seeing it with greater intensity. Now in education, in entertainment, in the media, Christians can be run out of business. They can be denied access to certain schools. They can be denied jobs because of their faithfulness to God, their biblical convictions. I mean, we're seeing it happen around us. And the enemy loves to confuse God's people and tempt us during those times to compromise on our faith. But I think we should cling to a verse like this. The people who know their God will be strong and take action. Amen? Amen. The truth is, many people have fallen away and will fall away during times of persecution. Isn't that always what happens? But people who are less committed tend to bail out when things get rough. The same is true of the faith. But this verse inspires me to remain faithful, to know God, and to be strong in him. These are times when we, we should press in and not back away. Time to live out our faith, to be strong and take action. Now we're at verse 36. This is a big transition in the chapter. This is a major shift in the prophecy because what we read now is future for us. Everything we've read so far has already happened. It was future for Daniel, but it already happened for us. It's our history. But now in verse 36, there's a shift, and it's talking about the distant future for Daniel, which is also future for us. This is the Old Testament's final description of that coming world leader that we commonly refer to as the Antichrist. So now let's read, the, read verse 36. It says this, Then the king will do as he pleases, and he will exalt himself and boast against every god and will speak dreadful things against the god of gods. And he will be successful until the indignation is finished because that which is determined will be done. You might recall a, a couple of weeks ago I gave you in your bulletin this image of how the prophets kind of viewed events in the future. They were prophesying, inspired by God to predict events that, that would come, but sometimes it would be regarding, like, for example, the first coming of Christ, and then another one would be the second coming of Christ. Like mountains in the distance, sometimes you can't exactly see how far the gap is between them. Prophecies sometimes have a near fulfillment, sometimes they have a distant fulfillment, a now fulfillment, a later fulfillment, a partial, and then a full fulfillment. So what we have here in verse 36 is a verse that was, in a sense, fulfilled by the slime ball. Antiochus IV, Epiphanes. But it's not fully fulfilled. 
When Antiochus set up the statue of Zeus in the temple, he spoke against the God of gods, like it mentions here. But he was still an idolater. He set up that image of, of Jupiter or Zeus in the temple. He still revered his Roman Greek gods. Here in this verse it says he boasts against every god. A little earlier in the verse. This is talking about the Antichrist. The Antichrist is different. He's going to boast against every god. He's going to essentially turn all religions into a religion of himself. You know, don't worship Zeus or Allah or Jesus. Worship me. That's going to be the Antichrist's agenda. It is clear that this is talking about something different now, about the very end of time. Look at the phrases, until the indignation is finished, until the time of wrath is complete. Verse 35, the verse right before this, talks about the end time. And so there's a, a shift happening in the chapter here, and we're starting to get prophetic glimpses of the Antichrist who is yet to come. Now let's continue on see what else we can learn about him. Verse 37, he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other god. There it is again. For he will boast against them all, but instead he will honor a god of fortresses, a god whom his father did not know, he will honor him with gold, silver, precious stones, and treasures. And he will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign god. He will give great honor to those who acknowledge him and will make them rulers over the many and will parcel out land for a price. So as I mentioned before, when you're dealing with the discussion of end times, interpretations abound. There's a lot of different interpretations about passages like this. And uh, sometimes I kind of wonder, you know, how much should I share about views that I don't believe in? I mean, that, that's a challenge of preaching, right? Is, uh, you know, you want to give a fair treatment. Here's all of the options, and I'm most persuaded by this one. But it could be challenging. I mean, that could take forever, right? Because <laughs> uh, there's so many different opinions. But I, I think it can be helpful, at least, to know what some people are thinking. And here in these verses that we just read, there's some fascinating possible clues here as to what kind of man the Antichrist will be. First notice that it said, he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers. That word gods is Elohim. Remember, that's, that's also a name for God, the capital G God. It's the plural of majesty. So it could easily be translated otherwise. He will show no regard for the God of his fathers, for Elohim. Now, is that a hint that the Antichrist will be of Jewish heritage? Some people think so. It's possible. Now, there's another hint here. Secondly, it's, notice that it says, he will show no regard for the desire of women. Now, some have postulated that that means that the Antichrist would be gay, that he'd be homosexual. That's an interesting proposition. But perhaps more convincingly, and this is what I believe, I believe that phrase about he will show no regard for the desire of women is a phrase referring to the Messiah. Remember that it was a common desire amongst Jewish women to be chosen from all to be the mother of the Messiah. That was the desire of women to birth the Messiah, to be honored in that way. What an honor that would be to give birth to the Savior of the world. Recall what Elizabeth said to Mary, the mother of Jesus, in Luke 1, 42. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. So overall, I, I believe it's likely that this verse is saying that the Antichrist will not regard the God of the Bible, for one, Elohim, nor his Messiah, that desire of women. And we know that to be true. I mean, that's, that's actually pretty easy. That the, the Antichrist would be against God and God's son, Jesus. Now, he's going to seem like a, a good guy at first. Everyone's going to like him. He's going to be a winner, very benevolent kind of guy. But then, after a while, he's going to reign as a tyrant, and it's going to be military might. And this is what I, I think it's talking about in verse 38, when it says his God is a God of fortresses, meaning it's just might makes right, power. That's his religion, is power, military might. Now let's finish the chapter, verse 40 through 45. And this is speaking of the final conflict, the final showdown. And at the end time, notice once again, end time. Don't ignore those little clues that we're talking about something yet future. And at the end time, the king of the south will wage war with him 
And the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he will enter countries, overflow them, and pass through. He will also enter the beautiful land. And many countries will fall. But these will be rescued out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon. Then he will reach out with his hand against other countries. And the land of Egypt will not escape. But he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver. And over all the precious things of Egypt. And Libyans and Ethiopians will follow at his heels. But rumors from the east and from the north will terrify him. And he will go out with great wrath to eliminate and annihilate many. And he will pitch the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. So this is all talking about that final conflict. The world's going to be a mess. I mean, this is essentially all countries are trying to kill each other. Great war. It's all centralized in Israel. The end of the world is marked by tremendous conflict. All of the world's armies will be gathered in Israel to do battle. And in the end, Antichrist will fail. He's going to fall just like his foreshadow, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, fell. So you can kind of summarize the Antichrist's life like this from the verses that we read. Verse 36, he's going to do what he wants. He's going to deify himself. He's going to defy the true God. Verse 37, he's going to disregard all religion. Verse 38, he's going to devote himself to the military. Verse 39, he's going to declare war on foreign powers. Verse 40, he's going to defend himself against other nations. Verse 41, he's going to defeat some early enemies. Verse 43, he's going to develop great wealth. And verse 45, he's going to be defeated and no one will come to his aid. I think that's the greatest part of this whole chapter. He will come to his end. He will come to his end. The final expression of human pride, the Antichrist, is going to get crushed. Now, back to our main points to conclude today. What does this all teach us about our God? God is faithful. God is in charge, and he can be trusted, and God will deal with evil. God is faithful. He doesn't forget his people. Rather, as we saw in verse 32, he strengthens them in trials and he rescues them. I mean, if God had a plan for all these kings of the north, kings of the south, all these, you know, Ptolemies and Seleucus and Antiochus, you can bet that he's got a plan for your life too. God can sort all of it out and you have a place in God's plan. He, he's faithful. Secondly, God is in charge and you can be trusted. God knows things before they happen. He knows the future better than we know the past. And all these fulfilled prophecies give us confidence in the fact that God is in control. He's the one orchestrating all things. I think that they should fuel our faith in what is yet to come. Those things that have been revealed to us in the Bible about the future. If God fulfilled everything to a T up to this point, why would we not trust what he's revealed in the future is going to happen? It's going to happen. We don't just take God at his word because people tell us to. God gave us a brain. And he wants us to use it. In Isaiah 1.18, God said, Come now, let us reason together. So God wants his people to use their minds. And reasonable people believe God, take him at his word, because he's already proved himself believable. We walk by faith, yes, but we stand on fact. And here we have what that one doctor said. There's 135 specific prophecies here. Those are facts we can stand on. We believe God because God has proved himself believable. And then lastly, God will deal with evil. Not the risk of sounding too simplistic. At the end of the day, all you really need to know is this. God wins. Let's say that together, ready? One, two, three. God wins. God wins. Are you on his side? Are you on his side? We as people will win with him because we are on his side. So how should all of these truths affect me? What should I do with my life? I actually want you to turn to 2 Peter 3, and we're going to end by reading this passage together. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 3. We've been living in the last days since Jesus ascended to heaven. And so what are we supposed to do? What, how are the people of the church supposed to behave? How are we supposed to live out these last days that we're in? This is what Peter says, the wisdom that God gives him to share. 2 Peter 3, starting verse 3, it says this, Know this first of all. That in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, 
Where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue just as they were from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed by being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly people. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be discovered. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found spotless and blameless by him. Jesus is coming back. We know he's going to win. All opposition against him will fall. But in the meantime... Let's live like the winners that we will be one day. Let's live holy lives. We want to be found spotless and blameless by him. Our conduct, our godliness, it matters. How we live. What we know should affect how we live. Because you can know all about the Bible. You can know prophecy back and forth. You can know all about God. But the real question is, do you know God? Do you have a saving personal relationship with the one who knows all things, and who's going to work all this out. And are you living for him? Because he's coming back. Let's pray. God, you, you ask us to be diligent, to be found spotless and blameless. And that's impossible. It's impossible without your son, Jesus. You sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and make us clean You offer us forgiveness of sins, wiping away our sins, making us clean through faith in Jesus Christ, your son who died on the cross for us, was buried and rose on the third day. We desire to be spotless and blameless, but we can only do so through faith in Jesus Christ. And then once we've established that relationship by faith, then you give us your Holy Spirit to help us live blameless and spotless lives. Those we war against the flesh in us. Father, I pray that for uh, those of us who do believe and have already accepted salvation by faith in Jesus, that you would help us to walk by the Spirit. There's so much about the future that we don't know, but we do know that your Son will come for his church, and we, we want to be presentable to him. We want to be caught doing the right thing about the master's business. So, Father, if there's sin that we need to repent, we do so now. Ask for your forgiveness and for your power through the Spirit uh, to walk in a a manner that pleases you. That's the, the sort of people that we ought to be in holy conduct and godliness. And, Father, if there's anybody listening that has not believed in you, but today perhaps you're, you're working on their heart, You're convincing them that they need salvation, that they need a Savior, that they've sinned. Father, would they repent of that sin and turn to Jesus Christ in faith, believing that his sacrifice was enough for them, that he's a risen Savior and Lord of all, and would they submit to him? Father, thanks so much for this scripture. Thank you for the study in Daniel. We look forward to wrapping it up together next week. Thank you for all the things that you've taught us, Lord. Uh, Quicken our minds. And uh, Lord, soften our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.